Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us on this ERS webinar which relates to the upcoming ERS monograph on COVID-19. My name is Sheila Ramjug and I'm a consultant pulmonologist working in the Manchester region with a specialist interest in pulmonary vascular disease and interstitial lung disease and my co-chair who needs little introduction is Professor Aureli Fabry, who is also chair of the ERS Assembly 3 and leading histopathologist working in the beautiful city of Dublin, again with a specialist interest in IRD. We are both part of the ERS monograph editorial board on COVID-19, overseen by Professor John Hurst. And we are super keen to share this exciting and novel live version of the COVID-19 monograph with the ERS members by hosting a webinar with three of the chapter's authors. You can see here that we are privileged to be joined by Liana Liu, who's from Toronto, speaking about societal responses to the pandemic. Uh, Professor Anita Sim Simons from London, who is not only the ERS president, but is also will be discussing COVID-19 vaccines, their regulation and clinical dilemmas as well. And finally, Francesco Amanti, who is working currently in Milan, who will be talking about the COVID-19 potential long-term sequelae. The format of the webinar will to have these three presentations followed by around 15 minutes of questions and answers. So during the presentations, please do not be shy to place any questions in the chat box, which you've already been using, but make sure that those questions are addressed not only to the panelists, but to all attendees as well, so we can all see the questions. So without further ado, we'd like to introduce Liana, who is affiliated with the Toronto Mood Disorders Psychopharmacological Unit, who will be discussing the effects of the societal responses to COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. So today I'm here to talk about the COVID-19, not pandemic, but syndemic. So we're going to discuss the economic, social, and biological determinants of health. Okay. So I have no real or perceived conflicts of interest, and I do receive fees from Braxia Scientific Core. So diving straight into it, as we know, over the past 15 months, it's become quite clear that COVID-19 is an unprecedented global public health crisis with, with its effects on economic, physical, and mental health. And so while early lockdown measures were effective for reducing viral transmission, it's augmented disparities underlying health. So when we think about COVID and when we conceptualize it, we should characterize it as a syndemic, meaning that in addition to the biologic forces that shape our health outcomes, we have these social and economic forces as well affecting health outcomes. Now with this in mind, there are three aims for this presentation. First is to discuss the gendered effect of COVID-19 on the economy the implications of COVID-19 on mental health and suicide. And lastly, is to understand COVID-19 as a social virus. In the most recent World Economic Outlook report, which was released in April of 2021, the International Monetary Fund projected a 6% growth for 2021 and a 4.4% growth for 2022. Now, while this growth is suggested to be powered by fiscal supports, the anticipated vaccine powered recovery and adaptation of economic activity, this trend isn't necessarily the same across all economies. So advanced economies such as the United States are expected to surpass their pre-COVID GDP levels and developing economies such as China have already returned to their pre-COVID GDP levels. But other countries in both these advanced and developing economies are likely only to recover in 2022, as well as late into 2023. And so these divergent recovery paths are likely to create significant gaps in living standards, as well as within country income inequality and increase the number of people in poverty. So first we're gonna ask um, just as a pre-presentation question, what is the she session? 
probably give about 10 seconds for that. Okay, so great. I think most people have quite a good idea of what the she session is and we'll get more into it in the presentation. So previous recessions have impacted sectors that were cyclical in nature, so they really had a pronounced effect on male unemployment. But this crisis is unique insofar that it has differentially affected the manufacturing and service sector, which comprises mostly of female employees. And so accordingly, females in these economies are less likely to be employed in occupations that offer remote working options. And so we come to this concept then of the she session, which means that the brunt of economic downfall is borne by women, especially in emerging and developing economies where there has been a slight higher rise in unemployment and a larger drop in participation compared to men. And so while this effect is less observed in developed economies, it's safe to say that women in both economies have been differentially affected by this crisis. So you'll see that this pandemic has really reinforced the role of females in the care economy, which refers to the burden of unpaid work in childcare and provision of the elderly. And this often ensues a significant impact on their ability to participate in the paid economy. So prior to this pandemic, females were responsible for a greater share of domestic labor compared to males. And a study in the United States found that women on average spent about 4.1 hours a day, while men spent about 1.7 hours per day on this type of work. But now given the closure of schools and caregiving facilities, women often now take on the responsibility as the majority shareholder, as an informal caregiver in the household, which substantially reduces their ability to fulfill work obligations. And it also reduces work opportunities as well as the opportunity for promotions. So keeping this in mind, we really see then that financial security is a key mediator of mental health during economic downturn. And speaking generally, macroeconomic indicators such as employment status are really important indicators of suicide risk because unexpected or abrupt changes in employment status also portend economic insecurity, which then diminishes timely utilization of healthcare services, loss of health benefits, and overall less disposable income for health services and other aspects of life. So for example, in Japan, the number of precarious workers decreased by 1.2 million, most of which were female employees. And at the same time, there was also an increase in suicide in this population following the cessation of the statewide emergency lockdown in July and August of 2020, which meant that people were losing their government provided subsidies. Now, during this time of increased risk, the number of suicides was 7.7% higher than the same months in the previous three years, which is, this is quite significant. And so in addition then to financial insecurity mediating this outcome, it was also due to school closures, decreased social interactions, magnification of the loneliness ap epidemic, and general emotional distress. And so we see that this outcome is not only particular to the female population, but also to the general population at large. And so two members of the research lab um, that I'm currently part of did an analysis looking at unemployment rate and suicide risk. And they found that a one point increase in unemployment rate was related to a 1% increase in suicide risk. So really the compounding effects of financial insecurity, unpaid work, family obligations, loneliness, et cetera, have really mediated mental illness and the risk of suicide. Now, I just mentioned this loneliness epidemic. So as I said earlier, COVID-19 is a syndemic. It's not just a pandemic. We've had the loneliness epidemic as well as the addiction epidemic that's been magnified. So prolonged quarantine and lockdown measures have really worsened these two phenomenons. And while measures have been implemented to reduce viral transmission, they've resulted as well in this maladaptive stress response leading to increased anxiety, depression, and general um, poor well being. And so in Canada, loneliness during the pandemic was quite pronounced in long term care homes. 
So to reduce or mitigate these effects of loneliness and psychological distress in long-term care homes, people have suggested increasing social engagement through virtual community befriending programs, having more calls with family members and friends, as well as integrating self-guided psychological therapies. However, critical to the implementation of these digital programs is to ensure you have funds sufficient to purchase and implement the programs. There are proper practice guidelines, as well as improving digital literacy. But as we've noticed with COVID-19, these have become significant barriers to access, which I'll also discuss later on. And so these digital divides are not only present in the loneliness epidemic, but also part of the addiction epidemic. Prior to COVID, there was already an ongoing public health substance use crisis. However, since the start of the pandemic, this has only increased the number of fatal overdoses and harms from substances such as opioids, methamphetamines, and cocaine, just as a few examples. So in British Columbia, it actually became the epicenter of opioid epidemic in 2016, but in June 2020, they also reported the highest number of opioid related deaths in Canada. So taken together, these physical distancing measures, as well as lockdown measures, have severely reduced access to critical health services, such as supervised consumption facilities, harm reduction facilities, and so limiting these programs has truly disrupted treatment programs and increased the risk of withdrawal and overdose fatalities. And so now one might suggest, what about telehealth? And so while telehealth has really become a popular avenue of care since the start of the pandemic, there are a few equity considerations to take into mind. Um, for example, telehealth does not really accommodate for the socioeconomic vulnerabilities of individuals with substance use disorders. So that could include a lack of smartphone, internet availability, et cetera, as well as in-person substance use treatment programs have also been severely limited due to, as I previously mentioned, these physical distancing measures and lockdown measures. So really there's a need to expand these health services in this population in primary care and community settings. So I've talked a lot about how COVID-19 is a syndemic, but we can also conceptualize this now as not only a biologic virus, but also a social virus. So the rapid transition from digital living has highlighted these digital inequities that are pervasive during the pandemic. As you can imagine, 15 months ago, we were working in person and then suddenly this pandemic hit and we were all forced to work remote. So there was quite a rapid transition. And so this kind of transition has also highlighted the significant association between digital exclusion, social exclusion, and poverty and health inequities. Now, just to summarize again, these kind of, um, these kind of exclusions can be categorized into three groups. First, an inaccessibility to digital technologies and services. Second, a cost to obtain a device and maintain internet fees. And third, a barrier to digital literacy and incorporation of this technology into daily living. In a healthcare setting, it's also been reported to be quite disruptive and complex. Telehealth isn't the solution for physical examinations or diagnostics. So there is a quite a barrier to implementation. And additionally, these there have been little training guidelines available to inform the safe and effective use of this digital platform. As well, it's not quite accessible for individuals living in rural and remote areas. So there's quite a limited ability to implement and expand practice via telehealth in all sectors. So that's not to say that it's not a good avenue of healthcare services, but it's important to keep in mind that they're not equally accessible. So in this case, the increased transmission of the virus and disease outbreaks in general should be characterized as well as socially transmitted conditions, which reflect the pervasive and social and environmental inequalities, such as overcrowding, hazardous working conditions, unemployment. Now, to really reiterate this point and bring it home, this pandemic is a syndemic. We've got augmentation of social and economic determinants of health, portending poor mental and physical outcomes. So we really need to gather experts outside of medicine to implement the appropriate protections. 
and towards the aim of meeting the World Health Organization's three priorities of global health security, which are universal health coverage, health emergencies, and better health and well being, we need to agree to pivot towards the three E's, which are economic stability, education, and equality. Rather than focusing on simply just healthcare, we need to look at all avenues and all determinants of health. Now, while the future of a pandemic is still unknown, it's important to highlight and target these vulnerable populations and support them in a biologic, economic, and social condition, social contexts now and well after the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Rianne, for this uh, uh, very interesting and great presentations. Next, I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Anita Simons, our current ERS president, and Professor of Respiratory Medicine and Sleep Medicine at the Royal Brompton Hospital in London, who is going to enlighten us about uh, regulation of COVID vaccines and uh, clinical uh, management. Thank you very much. And don't hesitate to put questions on the chat. We'll answer all of them at the end of the three presentations. Well, thank you very much indeed, Aurelie. Uh, COVID vaccines is a huge area to cover. Um, I should make two points at the beginning. First, my co-author for the chapter is Professor Rosemary Boyton, and uh, she has done much research on the immune response to uh, SARS-CoV-2 itself and also to vaccines um, and has covered that side of things. I'm able to speak to some extent on vaccine regulation uh, by virtue of being a member of the COVID task force for the European Medicines Agency. I'm healthcare professionals representative on that task force and it's been a very enlightening experience. I don't have any conflicts of interest. And my aim in this brief session is to talk about the new processes that have been used in regulation of COVID vaccines, which have enabled the really speeded up process of them being regulated and uh, coming into use to look at the concepts of vaccine efficacy, efficiency and safety monitoring. And then at the end to cover some of the current dilemmas on the management of adverse effects also on how we manage variants with uh, the vaccines that we have and vaccines that we may need in future. And then the uh, pretty controversial topic of vaccination in children. We have a range of vaccine platforms and I'm just going to summarize these to say that uh, we have focused on several the already established process of using uh, inactivated vaccine, for example, one of the Chinese uh, vaccines uses that uh, process. And then the ones that we have seen most are the use of the ad adenovirus vector containing the um, uh, protein um, that has been used in the AZ Oxford vaccination, uh, the Johnson & Johnson or Janssen vaccine, and also in the Russian uh, a, a vaccine from the Gamaleya Institute. Of course, we've also using the mRNA vaccines, and the first one that came on stream, of course, was the Pfizer-BioNTech one, and we subsequently have had Moderna and the Curevac vaccine, which uh, may well uh, come onto the market soon. And then there are other processes that are, are being used um, with vaccinations that are likely to come on stream, such as use of um, DNA plasmids, so DNA vaccine, and also one which again is coming near the large uh, phase three trials are, have been completed using uh, subunit, protein subunits, and that's the Novavax. And I'm not going to focus on this, but within the chapter, the monograph chapter, uh, Professor Boyton has gone into detail so you can understand the platforms in detail. Now, one of the questions that's often asked by individuals who are hesitant about receiving the vaccination is how come, how come these new vaccines came on stream so fast? And there is a good explanation for that, which is really important when we want to persuade those who uh, don't understand the process, how it's come about and how these COVID-19 vaccines are safe. 
the traditional development that we've known for many, many years now is an extremely lengthy one. And some vaccines have taken 15 years to come to market. But as we've seen in the last uh, one to two years, we have very rapidly obtained COVID-19 vaccines. And that is because the whole process has been telescoped. And you will see illustrated here, and this is from the uh, European Medicines Agency, the standard pathway where there are a whole series of processes such as the uh, development of the concept, the proof of concept, the non-clinical research testing in animals, and then phase one, two, and three trials uh, in humans. Uh, and then um, those uh, trial data being analysed, uh, the approval of the vaccination, then production started and then uh, widespread use of the vaccination. So what has changed here is you can see that many of these processes have been overlapped. We were fortunate in that the sequencing of the virus was, was carried out very early and we had that data available from China uh, and then through uh, fortuitous processes, um, the fact that the adenovirus vector process had been used in the Ebola vaccine, and so that was technology that was ready there for the um, spike protein unit to be incorporated into the chimp adenovirus vector, plus over the last five years or slightly more, the mRNA technology had been developed so that it was possible to quickly move to um, proof of concept, production, uh, testing in animals, and then some of the phase one, two and three studies were overlapped. And at the same time, there has been really amazing collaboration between academia, between pharma to work together and then being supported um, nationally by a, a number of countries, government agencies, um, so that the uh, development and the vaccines were put into production before the results of the phase three trials were were known. And that meant that as soon as um, we had that data, uh, the vaccine was there and could be rolled out and uh, delivered to individuals. A further really important change was that instead of this standard process where all the animal work and then the human trials looking at immunogenicity, safety, and then the bigger trials on thousands of um, uh, individuals in the phase three trials, and then that data being submitted as we've usually seen in the past, to the regulatory bodies, whether it's the FDA, European Medicines Agency, the MHRA in uh, the UK, and, and many countries have their own agencies too. The data has been submitted on a rolling review basis. So information from the animal studies, the phase one studies, the phase two studies have gone to the regulatory bodies who've looked at it. The companies who are making the vaccine can pose questions to those um, regulatory bodies who have addressed those questions and helped improve the design of the studies as they've gone on. So this has been an iterative process. So at the end of the phase three studies, as so much was known already, interim analysis and so forth, the approval, which is um, conditional marketing approval for the EMA or um, emergency use approval in the FDA, for example, was a very quick process. Um, and this was the reason why the whole thing was speeded up. Now, what the phase three trials tell us, they tell us important information about the safety of the vaccine, but also the key word is the efficacy of the vaccine. And although we were expecting to approve any vaccine that had an efficacy of over 50%, I think everyone was um, amazed and really very gratified that the first um, vaccines we saw had a much higher efficacy uh, uh, somewhere between 66 and 95 percent. It's important too to understand what efficacy means. I'm sure you do, but many people think that if a, a vaccine is say 95% efficacious, that means 5% who've had the vaccination would get the infection, 95% wouldn't. That's not true. What it means is that compared to a control group, the group who had the vaccination are 95% less likely to become infected. Now, we also wanted to know other things like the efficacy of the first dose and also the impact of the vaccine 
on severe disease, hospitalizations and deaths because of the very high concern that health services would be overwhelmed and uh, that populations might be able to sustain and manage mild disease, but it's the severe disease, uh, hospitalization, intensive care stay and deaths, which of course are, are crucial to, to avoid. And there were further data we got from the trials of avoiding the severe effects. Now, once this vaccine goes out or all the vaccines go out into the real world, what we understand then is the efficiency in populations that aren't well controlled as in the phase three trials. Of course, in phase three trials, uh, you don't have pregnant women. There are um, elderly, about 15% are elderly, but you don't have super elderly patients. And although you have some with underlying comorbidity, you don't have large numbers. The good um, point about the, the trials and then the rolling out to so the efficiency efficiency in the real world, and we've got good data from Israel, is that in when used in these more diverse populations, the efficiency is virtually as good as the efficacy. And you can see here that as you increase from uh, first dose, second dose, and to seven days after um, the second dose, there are very high levels of efficiency of, of the vaccination. Now, what we also learn um, is safety. To some degree, we understand safety from the phase three trials, but it's not until the vaccine is used in multiples of thousands and millions of individuals that we understand some of the other more minor side effects. And so once um, a vaccine is being used widely, uh, we need to know other things, the safety in uh, pregnant and breastfeeding women, um, what is the safety in individuals with comorbidities and in particular what is uh, the protection afforded to individuals with um, uh, immunosuppression from from uh, cancer from other um, immune diseases and uh, I'll come back to safety in children they weren't included in the original trials and so there are whole processes monitoring the quality of the components of the vaccination understanding about toxicity in animal studies largely and then once the vaccine is in use there are a range of um, ways of gathering information from the population so large databases the huge vigilance database in uh, the European Union many other countries have their own database where um, medical teams and individuals themselves can report in so we can immediately pick up safety um, signals and we have to understand these signals as well because there are a whole range of factors that contribute to these. For example, Comirnaty, which is the Pfizer-BioNTech, Moderna, AstraZeneca vaccines were used in different proportions in different countries. Um, so high use of Moderna in the US, but not so much elsewhere in Europe, high use of the AZ vaccination in the United Kingdom. And also the populations that originally received these were, were uh, we had to understand the components of those so at the beginning, high risk individuals, so elderly patients, but also healthcare workers. Healthcare workers uh, are, are younger on average and have more females in them. So when you're understanding adverse events, all these factors have to take, be taken into account. And of course, it was important to do that because we came across a really important, extremely rare adverse effect. Um, but, and that is, as you know, vaccine induced immuno, immune thrombosis or thrombocytopenia, which was first seen with the AstraZeneca vaccine, but it also occurs with the um, Janssen or Johnson and Johnson vaccine. And this just tells you the time pathway of the first report from the German team, Gren Asher et al. Um, the reports coming in from the databases, the analysis of these, the meetings of the uh, risk assessment committees, release of information to um, healthcare professionals and then the incorporation of the advice into um, the information that's given out with the vaccines. And there are now good uh, management pathways, algorithms to manage this uh, rare side effect. I've just picked one here, which is from the um, International Society of Thrombosis and Hemostasis. Um, so understanding the potential um, effects, so headaches, abdominal pain um, within four to 28 days of uh, one of the vaccinations, AstraZeneca or Johnson & Johnson, how to, how to screen an image for it, um, and then 
if we come to the next slide here, so you're screening for the platelet count, thrombosis imaging, looking at clotting, D-dimers, uh, and then importantly looking for the um, antibody to platelet factor 4 on ELISA testing to confirm the diagnosis. But if there's a high level of suspicion, don't wait. Treat with intravenous immunoglobulin, steroids if the platelet count is low. Um, avoid heparin, but use non-heparin anticoagulation. Uh, get advice, make sure you're in line with the current treatment and plasma exchange might be needed. So we've learned a lot. And in fact, the mortality from this rare side effect is going down as people recognize it more quickly and treat it appropriately. But importantly, we have to contextualize the risk of these, um, this problem. And this is from the European Medicines Agency, but there was also an important um, visual publication too from the um, University of Oxford um, Winton Institute showing how you can help uh, the public understand the risk of the vaccine um, that is here compared to the risk from COVID itself depending on the prevalence rate of the infection in the population and so these values will change. I've just pick the slide here for the medium infection rate, but you can see at a certain point here, 30 to 39, there's almost equivalence between the risk of uh, death from COVID and also having this very rare side effect. So this um, has proved helpful in, in public understanding. Two final points I want to cover. One is that, of course, we're all worried now about variants, as we're seeing more variants. Uh, what we use as a correlate of protection is neutralizing antibody. And we know from the phase three studies that in the wild type, the original um, uh, uh, Wuhan um, uh, virus, our, our vaccination was extremely effect, um, effective and efficacious, but there was uh, some reduced levels in the elderly. We see a small drop off. This is the um, alpha uh, variants, the um, UK variant, small drop off, but with other types of, of variants, um, depending on the mutation, we may see further drop offs. And this is again explained in, in the monograph by Professor Boyton. And we see some small levels of reduction in uh, efficacy of the vaccine, but no marked drop off. And the variant that we're contending with now, so the vast majority of the viruses in the UK are the Delta variant. I understand it's about 10% prevalence in the US, about 45% in France. There is a small drop off, um, but over 90% um, efficiency of uh, the vaccination, both the um, uh, mRNA vaccine and the AstraZeneca vac vaccine. Now, um, the last point quickly is just to cover um, whether the, and this is a societal issue, whether we should be vaccinating children. We have got uh, efficiency demonstrated for the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna is likely to be published soon. Um, there certainly ought to be a role in children with comorbidities. There have been small numbers of ad adverse events seen, uh, such as myocarditis in the trials, but they've been mild and treatable. Um, but what about the impact of the new variants on children? There is some anecdotal evidence that the, the um, COVID may be slightly more severe with the new variant, the Delta variant, more hospitalizations, and possibly the instance of the multi-system inflammatory syndrome and long COVID might be increased, but we don't know that yet. But what about children comprise about 25% of the population? So if you need 80% of the population um, protected for herd immunity, then you would have to vaccinate some children. And not only is safety a key issue with children, but it's understanding the effect of COVID. They may not be ill, but they miss school um, and uh, it has a significant impact on their social life and uh, mental and, and, and psychological well-being. And the final consideration is, should we go ahead and vaccinate children when there are still high risk adults and healthcare workers uh, who have not been vaccinated in low resource settings? So I end with a poll. And uh, would you like to answer those questions? Should we offer it to all children? What about children with comorbidities or 12 to 18 year olds or children should not be vaccinated until adults have been fully vaccinated, particularly high risk ones?
and we'll probably stop in the interest of time now and see what people thought. Ah, oh, it's mixed. So perhaps we can um, uh, go back to discussion on this um, at the end. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for such a clear uh, presentation of the process. Thank you. I would like to now introduce our final speaker, uh, Dr. Francesco Amanti, who is a pulmonologist working in Milan, who will be discussing um, post-COVID-19 sequelae. Thank you. So uh, thank you for, uh, for the introduction. Uh, I also want to, to thank Professor uh, Mantero, Professor uh, Blasi uh, and Dr. Gramegna, who wrote this chapter uh, with, uh, with me. Uh, I have no conflict uh, of interest concerning this presentation. Um, so we know uh, that knowledge about the clinical management of acute disease has rapidly grown, but little is known about long-term complication and sequela. So um, the chapters aims to explore the knowledge currently available to investigate the clinical consequences of COVID-19, especially in patients who have overcome the acute disease. So uh, in this chapter, we focus on definition and classification of COVID-19 sequelae. And furthermore, we, we describe and we distinct uh, cardiorespiratory and dextrarespiratory sequelae because they can facilitate the understanding of the problem and the clinical management of the, of the patients. Um, so during the last year, knowledge has uh, accumulated, enabling us to, to, to better understand the key points of the acute phase. In the last months, we are focusing from the acute COVID-19 phase to the post-acute COVID-19, and in particular to chronic post-COVID-19. Uh, we focus the clinical, the clinical research has been moved on the, uh, on the long-term co consequences of, uh, of, the, of the disease. Because although less dramatic, uh, these manifestations are present in most patients, affecting quality of life and return to daily activities. But in a limited number of cases, post-COVID-19 sequelae may cause serious and irreversible organ damage. So data from literature has showed that uh, readmission and death after hospital discharge contribute to the burden of the disease. For example, an observational study uh, in a large multi-hospital system in Michigan that include more than 2,000 hospitalized patients reported readmission in nearly 20% of, uh, of patients and uh, death in nearly 10% of patients within 16 days from uh, discharge. The most common reason for readmission were COVID-19 itself, but also sepsis, pneumonia, heart failure, and in particular, patients with readmission were older and needed ICU setting. So this observation suggests a period of higher fragility and the risk of worse outcomes immediately after clinical recovery. So um, definition and the classification of uh, post-COVID-19 sequelae is a thorny, is a really thorny issue. Um, actually, there is no clear consensus uh, uh, definition for this condition. Uh, terminology uh, include uh, uh, long COVID, post-COVID syndrome, post-COVID sequelae, and post-acute COVID-19 syndrome. So in, uh, in our chapter, some proposal for definition and classification of post-COVID-19 sequelae are, uh, are presented. Uh, these proposals are based on three different characteristics. First of all, uh, time of onset. Um, second, uh, a severity-based 
assessment of, uh, of the sequelae. And uh, finally, uh, based on the organ involved by COVID-19. Um, so if we focus on uh, time-based uh, definition, we know that uh, COVID acute phase uh, is well defined in, uh, in literature, but the same concept does it apply to post-COVID-19 sequelae. Um, in literature, acute phase is defined as the time between the onset of symptoms and the hospital discharge, but could, could be extended to clinical recovery for those who um, does not require um, hospitalization. On the contrary, post-COVID-19 phase does not have a clear definition but is generally considered as the period immediately following the recovery without further details on duration in terms of days or in terms of weeks. Most of the studies aim to investigate the symptoms and health consequences in post-COVID phase included hospital patient with a mean follow-up time of three months after discharge from the hospital. But to date, no data exists on a follow-up period longer than 12 months in those patients. So we decided to include in, uh, in our chapter a figure that reported the frequency and the evolution from the acute phase to COVID recovery to post-COVID-19 and COVID sequelae of, uh, of, the, um, of, the, of, of this sequela. Symptoms that appear at different times after recovery from, um, from the acute phase are, are shown in, uh, in, uh, in this figure. Another approach to classify post-COVID-19 sequelae could be based on severity. Um, indeed, uh, Post-COVID um, sequelae can be classified according to their severity in mild, moderate, or uh, uh, severe or non reversible uh, uh, sequelae. Um, per, um, mild sequelae include persistent but reversible symptom with no need of treatment. They are present in most patients at three, six months after recovery and that are usually attributed to the systemic uh, hyperinflammation. So for example, myalgia, uh, head H, or uh, they are related to, to the respiratory involvement, uh, such as uh, dyspnea or cough. Uh, so this might reflect multiple mechanisms and including specific organ damage and the deconditioning that follows week of bed rest and low physical activity, especially in patients who were exposed to uh, the ICU setting. Um, Post-COVID uh, mm, sequelae of moderate se severity require active intervention in terms of diagnosis and treatment, but are generally treatable and reversible. These complications are often neurological and mental health and include dementia, depression, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder. Uh, finally, uh, severe sequelae are not so common, but are represented by chronic organ failure or dysfunction, such as cardiovascular events, myocarditis, uh, renal failure, pulmonary fibrosis. These effects are usually long-term and not reversible or even progressive. Uh, frequently, they are consequences of some organ damage that uh, has started during the acute phase. In particular, moderate and uh, uh, severe post-COVID uh, sequelae often require extra investigation and might benefit from a, a multidisciplinary approach in order to provide a comprehensive uh, and an holistic care uh, and uh, give to the patient an agreed plan of treatment uh, um, for, for patients who are affected by, by this type of, uh, of sequelae. 
Another approach that uh, we describe in the chapter is to classify sequelae according to the organ involved by the sequela. Um, sequ sequela of COVID-19 can involve uh, uh, several organs causing syndrome that result from different pathophysiological process. We know that respiratory complication and cardiovascular involvement are the two main determinants of mortality and morbidity during the acute infection phase. So um, it has been uh, hypothesized uh, that heart and lungs are the organs that are most frequently involved also in, uh, in a long-term uh, sequela. Um, Detailed description of, uh, of the different uh, organ involvement, uh, involvement in the post COVID 19 phases is reported in our chapter according to the classification between cardiorespiratory and uh, extra respiratory sequelae. This distinction between cardiorespiratory and uh, um, extra respiratory sequelae is, uh, is um, of paramount, paramount importance because. Um, can facilitate the understanding of the problem and the clinical management of the patient. Um, in the chapter, uh, each sequelae is uh, extensively described in terms of pathophysiology, frequency of occurrence, uh, and setting in which has been identified. In, uh, in this presentation, I just reported that the main organ sequelae uh, described in the literature. Uh, in the chapter, we also reported the strengths and the quality of evidence for each sequelae uh, described. Um, the quality of evidence uh, is underlined at the end of each paragraph uh, in order to, 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 to rank uh, the advice that generate uh, clinical uh, application. Uh, for example, uh, if we look at um, uh, pulmonary fibrosis, pulmonary fibrosis is a known sequela of, se of severe lung damage secondary to many etiologies, including a respiratory infection. Uh, radiological and histological findings of pulmonary fibrosis were reported for following uh, uh, lung involvement uh, during SARS uh, and MERS-2, um, two respiratory viruses uh, that share uh, a lot, uh, many similarities uh, with uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2. For this reason, we focus in the chapter on mechanism and occurrence of the fibrotic lung disease in COVID-19. However, um, different from uh, data on SARS and, uh, and MERS, follow-up data are obviously uh, lacking on the long term. So we assume that multicenter longitudinal studies are needed. To, to, to elucidate the progression of COVID-19 uh, related uh, pulmonary fibrosis and the rationale for the use of some drugs, some, uh, for example, long-term steroids or antifibrotic agents. Finally, um, extra respiratory sequelae are frequently reported in patients with COVID-19. Um, however, the quality of evidence is low and comes mostly from uh, case series or observational uh, studies. But several factors can contribute to this type of sequelae, such as uh, systemic inflammation in case of uh, systemic uh, sequelae or renal uh, sequelae, um, consequences of hospitalization of social isolation uh, is in case of uh, neurocognitive alteration, of uh, uh, tropism of SARS-CoV-2 for uh, uh, some um, organs uh, that are not uh, only lung or, um, or heart. For example, SARS-CoV-2 um, can spread to central neural system via retrograde axonal transport from peripheral nerves such as the olfactory nerve or by, by bloodstream. So um, in conclusion, uh, COVID-19 can cause long-term sequelae in a relevant, relevant number of patients. In this chapter, we, we try to, to define and classify post-COVID-19 sequelae. And we divide the sequelae according to time, severity, 
and the organ involved in order to facilitate the understanding of the problem and the clinical management of the patient. But is, um, is uh, crucial to run prospective and follow-up studies and a multidisciplinary approach, especially in, in patients with progressive symptoms and multi-organ involvement, uh, to describe the long-term evolution and the possible intervention to treat or reduce the impact of post-COVID-19 sequelae. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Francesco, for a very interesting uh, presentation. I am um, going to uh, open up for questions, but I'm going to start with some of the questions. Some of them have already been answered on the chat. I hope people have seen that. Maybe we go back to uh, Prof. Simons and see uh, if she wants to comment on the poll about uh, vaccinating children. Um, please. Well, I, I think it is a a real controversy. Um, it's already started. So 12 to 18 year olds, as, as I think people will know, are being vaccinated in the US. I believe vaccination of children has started in Italy. Um, I, I, I think it's not a absolute because, you know, it sounds very poor that we are concentrating all the vaccination in the high resource settings and not low resource, but probably it has to be done together. Um, I certainly think there's no controversy about vaccinating children who have um, comorbidities and also the, the, those that are living in um, care homes um, and who have high risk of, of infection from that perspective. So I suspect it's going to happen, but of course it has to be that they're offered it. It's in no way is ever going to be compulsory. Sure. I have another question regarding vaccine. Do you think we should all get a booster in, September, in the winter in September? <laughs> it's a good question. I think people are, are basically working on that. Um, and I suspect it, I don't know, but I, it, what, one of the ways it looks like it will happen is that boosters may be offered to the elderly and perhaps to healthcare workers. And there was a, uh, quickly, there was a question in the uh, chat as well. And I, it, there, there is a preprint I read this morning showing that an individual who was immunosuppressed with a B-cell lymphoma had no response to the first two jabs, but then did have a response to a booster. So maybe uh, immunosuppressed individuals may, may benefit too. Uh, I don't know if you, any other panelists have a question. I have a question for Francesco. Um, I think very to, quick. Yeah, go on. Yeah. Sorry, Aurelie, really, uh, Liana, there was a, a very nice question which you answered in the chat, but I'm not sure if everyone was able to see your answer. Um, one of our attendees suggested, um, or oh, actually, sorry, it was Professor Simon suggested that some countries have not seen an increase in suicide as yet but have seen high levels of domestic abuse. Um, are, are you able to, to comment on that at all, Liana? For sure, yes. Um, so that's true. Not all countries have seen an increase in, uh, in suicide. And I mean, there are various reasons for that. Different countries also had different stringency levels um, in terms of their lockdown. And there may also be a delay in um, reporting the numbers um, kind of those logistical things going on. But in terms of an increase in domestic abuse, that is an interesting point because some countries, yes, have witnessed an increase in domestic abuse, intimate partner violence. Um, but interestingly as well, some countries have also reported a decrease in the number of domestic violence calls they get on their hotlines. And the reasons they have suggested for that is because perhaps like they're living in close quarters. Um, so they're not able to reach those hotlines. Um, there were also decreased social interactions and um, appointments with um, doctors where they would do physical examinations. And that's also um, like a point of contact where other people would notice um, like domestic partner violence. Um, and so there has also been an increase in child abuse, given that some students are not going to school. And there's also tremendous pressure on their parents as well, especially for those who do not work from home um, to find care for their children. So it's um, I would say it's for sure that these trends are not homogeneous across all all countries, given different contexts. But I'd say that's kind of like the 
the point we are, like the stage we're at. Thank you very much. Uh, Francesco, I had a question about uh, lung fibrosis in post-COVID. How do you think, do you think it's real? Do you think it's, a over, um, it's an overused term? Do you think radiology is overcoding it? What's your view on, on, on lung fibrosis post-COVID? So, 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 so the problem with, uh, with pulmonary fibrosis in, uh, in COVID-19 is that um, um, if we try to analyze the uh, data in, um, in Milan, because we, we already have a database that is shared between um, a lot of hospitals in Milan, and it's shared with, uh, with, uh, with the, the radiologist too. And um, surprising, uh, some patients that have uh, had a mild disease uh, develop um, um, a pulmonary fibrosis that was progressive. And uh, this was uh, surprising for us. Uh, other patients that um, were exposed to, to the ICU that uh, had a higher level of uh, inflammatory markers, um, they uh, didn't, uh, and they are currently um, they are um, without fibrosis uh, in, the, in the lung. So we, we see uh, um, um, a lot of, uh, of um, different uh, um, uh, kind of, uh, of pulmonary fibrosis and especially the, the radiology uh, was uh, uh, heterogeneous for this patient. Maybe because this was the effect uh, of, uh, of treatment during the acute phase, for example, uh, the, the, the treatment with the steroids, because the treatment with steroids was not homogeneous in most patients. Or for example, the treatment with, uh, with CPAP that is um, extremely used in, uh, in Europe and, and especially in, uh, in, uh, in Italy. So for example, the, the lung injury, the induced lung injury can be um, another, another explanation, or um, we can see a clear correlation with inflammatory markers in, uh, in our center, but uh, I don't know if uh, there are other uh, um, opinions or, or other uh, uh, data. Uh, it's uh, it's um, a promising field, but uh, it's really, really challenging for us. There's a question on the chat about use of antifibrotics in, in post-COVID lung fibrosis. Do you have any experience? Uh, so uh, data from literature are, uh, are, um, are lacking. We started to use just uh, in one case, an antifibrotic agent for one patient that uh, was treated for, um, with steroids for a long time. Um, he declined. Uh, and uh, we decided to, to start the treatment, the, to, the, the treatment with the uh, antifibrotic, but uh, we don't have uh, long-term uh, outcome data because the patient died one uh, week uh, uh, after, the, after starting uh, antifibrotic treatment. So uh, this was uh, just uh, <laughs> our case uh, in, uh, in, our, uh, in our hospital. But um, we have some patients that uh, um, are declining um, during uh, steroid treatment, uh, and uh, maybe in the future we'll, we will propose to, to them uh, antifibro the antifibrotic agents. Okay, there was one question about prevalence of pulmonary hypertension post COVID. So, data from uh, SARS and MERS. Um, is about 5% uh, on long-term data. So 20, uh, 10 years after, um, after, the, um, the, 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 after the, 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 the infection. Um, so in um, data that, uh, that um, are on three, six months show uh, about 20%, but the rate uh, maybe um, at one year or five year will decrease. 
think that's really interesting, certainly from all of our ECMO patients, COVID ECMO patients who had, and even ICU who had dreadful right ventricular dysfunction and evidence of pulmonary hypertension on echoes. Fortunately, all of those patients that have survived, their right ventricles have returned um, to normal. And admittedly, that is our single centre cohort and certainly in all those patients that I'm seeing or with our team in the pulmonary embolism clinic that we do we are seeing the majority of patients who who have survived from COVID-19 and have had pulmonary embolism and they a lot of them do have um, long COVID symptoms with fortunately resolution of those embolic events and um, no obvious evidence of right heart strain so it is really interesting from how we thought things would change. And it's just such an evolving situation, but I'd be told off if I don't ask this question because one of my colleagues um, who uh, runs our FIT clinic um, has posted uh, a question and it's something I've always wondered for the whole panel, I suppose, is in those patients with progressive pulmonary fibrosis, could it be considered that COVID-19 was more of a trigger rather than the cause? And you do wonder that for many, um, of the, the sequelae relating to the, our patients who we're looking after. What do you, what are your thoughts? So it's, uh, in some patients, COVID-19 can be, can be the trigger more than, uh, rather than, than, than a cause. It's, uh, it's similar to, to, to patients with uh, um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, also in, in idiopathic for pulmonary fibrosis, so maybe they have a, uh, a phenotypic or an endotypic pattern, and then the, the, the trigger that can be represented by, by, by virus or, um, or other things can accelerate the process. The same thing can, can be applied to, to um, COVID-19 pulmonary fibrosis, but we need the data on this patient. We need to endotype this patient. We need to phenotype this patient. We need the biomarkers in these patients. Uh, I think that uh, all, these all these things are crucial to understand uh, and manage the problem in the future. Thank you. Okay. I think this is time, time to close. I'd like to seriously thank our three presenters. It was a, they were extremely interesting up-to-date presentations. I'd like to thank all the participants joining in, putting questions on the chat. Maybe we'll see you again pretty soon on the, another maybe series of uh, presentation from our monograph and obviously follow the ERS website and all the different social media attached to it to see what's coming up uh, on the subject. Thank you very much, have a good evening. And